Hey kids, welcome back to Storytime with Kirk Thompson and Music History 101. Providing some very interesting tidbits on the personal lives of some of these famous composers. Now we're starting to get up into some composers I'm well aware of. We're still in the Baroque era. Um, this next guy here is Antonio Vivaldi, 1678, and died in 1741. He is considered one of the foremost Italian composers of the Baroque era. He was famous, well-respected, and made a comfortable living most of his life, but he died a pauper. That's the way it goes. Yikes. He's as poor as a church mouse. Vivaldi might take offense at being called an Italian, since he was actually born and lived in Venice. At that time, Venice was a separate city-state, so Vivaldi was technically a Venetian, not an Italian. Maintaining the distinction between Venetians and Italians is something that you had you had to be... Uh, wait a minute. That didn't make real... Too, let me read that again to make too much sense. Maintaining the distinction between Venetians and Italians is something that you had to be a Venetian to be really good at. Nowadays, it's virtually a lost art. So I guess they had their own little prejudice back then. When little Antonio was born, the midwife who delivered him baptized him right away. She wasn't at all sure he'd make it, and wanted to give him a fighting chance at the pearly gates. He did survive, although he remained sickly all his life. Vivaldi's mother, Camilla, was a simple tailor's daughter, and his father, Giambattista, was a barber and also a talented violinist. He had three sisters and two brothers, who were always getting into trouble. His brother... Francesco was banished for making faces at a big shot. Hmm. Okay, so Vivaldi studied for the priesthood and finally made it, although it took him nearly ten years to get around to all the various stages of the holy orders. Even after he became a full-fledged priest, he hardly ever said mass. He claimed that his weak health and asthmatic condition made it too difficult for him. Some biographers prefer to believe that he could never get through a whole mass in one sitting because he was always dashing off to the sacristy to jot down a musical theme that had just popped into his head. Some biographers also have a theory that he was high up in the Venetian criminal page turn, underworld. There's no need to take this theory, this theory seriously. Because of the color of his hair, Vivaldi was nicknamed Il Pret Rosa, or the Red Priest. Today he might be called Caradhead. Vivaldi spent most of his life as a teacher of violin at the Ospedale della Pieta, which was a school for orphan girls. The Pieta was built in 1348, one of the four institutions in the city, built to house fondlings, orphans, and other destitute children. There must have been a lot of these since the original building was expanded several times over the centuries before Vivaldi came to teach there. The Pieta was intended exclusively for girls and young women, many of whom were illegitimate offspring of concubines and mistresses of the wealthy and powerful. The orphanage was surrounded by a big stone wall with an iron gate. Besides the gate was a little nook in the wall, just big enough to hold a baby. The porter went out every morning to check for new arrivals. The gate also had a large stern sign warning everyone that the babies left in the nook had better be ones that they couldn't care for them by themselves. The vast majority of his music, Vivaldi composed for his pupils at the orphanage, which had developed an orchestra that was renowned all over Europe. Every Sunday, the Pieta Orchestra gave a recital for which the chapel was usually packed. Since it was in a church, applause was not permitted. Instead, the audience members showed their appreci appreciation by coughing or blowing their nose loudly. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Some of the orphanage girls came to be quite celebrated for their musical ability. Vivaldi himself was gaining quite a reputation, both as a violinist and as a composer. As well as teaching at the Piazza, he played fiddle in the Opera House Orchestra and sometimes filled in as a music director at the orphanage for Francesco Gasparini, who had a habit of disappearing on occasion. One day in 1713, he took a leave of absence and never came back. So I guess... Uh, Gasparini did disappear quite a lot, and then for good. Venice, in Vivaldi's time, was an exciting place to be. There was music everywhere. Even the lowliest cobblers and fruit vendors 
would whistle tunes in the marketplace. Gondoliers would burst into song at the least provocation. But the Venetians were an odd lot. There was nothing they liked more than spending vast amounts of money on expensive and elaborate clothing. They passed strict laws limiting the number of days when you were allowed to dress up. In 1732, the, the state passed a law prohibiting fans that were too luxurious. In 1750, it passed a law that ladies visiting each other could serve refreshments worth no more than a ducat. Nevertheless, visitors flocked to the city each year to take part in the famous carnival festivities. Kings and queens and dukes and duchesses and members of the European nobility came for visits and went to parties, concerts, and opera performances. When Frederick IV of Denmark and Norway visited Venice for the carnival of 1708, he introduced himself to everybody as the Count of Oldenburg, just so he could avoid all that bowing and scraping that kings usually have to put up with. He was so taken with the beauty of Venetian women that he had twelve miniature portraits painted of his favorites to carry around with him. The crown prince and prince of Russia caused quite a, I'm guessing the word is stir, nope, concoct commotion during their visit when they refused to pay half their hotel bill. That's bizarre. They also didn't leave a tip. <laughs> In 1713, Vivaldi turned his hand to composing operas, 49 of which survive today. His first opera was Atone in Villa, with a libretto by Dominic Lali. Lali's real name was Sabastino Biancardi, but he changed it after leaving Naples, accused of embezzlement. Huh. These operas were written between 1713 and 1739 for an average of nearly two each year. Vivaldi himself says he wrote 94 operas, so this may not be the most accurate figure. His record time was the opera Tito Manilo, composed in only five days. He says so himself on the frontispiece. Vivaldi once boasted that he composed faster than a copyist could write down the music. He saved time by using shortcuts. In the manuscript of one of his violin con concertos, he gave up writing... He, he gave up writing out the figured bass part and marked a section he'd already done with the comment for the dimwits. Going to an 18th century Venetian opera was definitely more fun if you were rich. Rich people sat in private boxes where they could gamble and have food brought in. They had great fun dropping orange peels and spitting on the people. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> we got to read that again. Okay. Going to an 18th century Venetian opera was definitely more fun if you were rich. Rich people sat in the private boxes where they could gamble and have food brought in. That part I understand. They had great fun dropping orange peels and spitting on the people below, <laughs> often aiming to put out their candles. <laughs> well, that is funny. Opera singers posed their own particular problems for the composer. The famous castrato Luigi Marchesi, for instance, insisted that no matter what character he was playing in whatever opera, his first entrance had to be from the top of a hill. It didn't matter to him if the opera had no need for a hill in its plot. Either he got a hill or he didn't sing. Wearing a plumed helmet and carrying a sword, shield and lance, Marchesi would enter singing the aria, singing the aria, Mia Speranza Io Per Vore, which the composer Giuseppe Sarti had written especially for him. Although Vivaldi's operas were very popular in his day, and he also composed quite a lot of music for church use, he is best remembered now for his many concertos, most of them for violin and orchestra. Among the best known of his orchestral concertos are also are those known as the Four Seasons. Even people who don't like classical music like Vivaldi's Four Seasons, so he must be doing something right. Vivaldi's Four Seasons. I like it myself. All in all, Vivaldi composed about four hundred and fifty concertos of one sort or another. Wow. <coughs> four hundred and fifty concertos. And uh, I actually like Vivaldi myself. Um, and if you look on my YouTube channel here, where you're probably watching me, if you in the search box um, type Vivaldi, um, you'll find me playing Vivaldi's Concerto in A-flat for trumpet. And um, I really like that one quite a bit. So Vivaldi was jamming.
But I had no idea he jammed about 450. That's absolutely amazing, 450 concertos. Uh, people who find his music too repetitious are inclined to say that he wrote the same concerto 450 times. This is hardly fair. He wrote two concertos 220 time, 225 times each. Okay, so that's the end um, of our little lecture in Delve into History on Antonio Vivaldi. He died in 1741, a good 30-some-odd years before our country, USA, was, um, was officially born. So, kids, um, you're probably in dreamland now. You've all, this is a long one. You've fallen asleep, and um, you'll probably wake up in the morning, and, and you're... Um, your computer will, will still be flashing or might have been put to sleep. But anyway, this was um, Story Time with Kurt Thompson and Music 101. And until next time, get the cocoa ready.